here we are coming up to Pentecost. Next week is, is going to be Pentecost weekend. And I want to ask a question. Do we all know in the story of the one garden, the two trees, and the many problems, the many bad choices we're experiencing right now in this world? Turn with me to Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4. And I want to read this uh, in the Amplified Bible version. And I'm breaking in, of course, after a long account of the story of creation, that this is the history or the origin of the heavens and the earth when they were created at that time when the Lord God, which in Hebrew is Yahweh Elohim, okay, made the heavens and the earth. No shrub or plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprouted. It's an interesting story. You know, there was, you, you realize there were very definite stages of things. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist, that is, you know, something, the idea is something like a fog or a dew or a vapor. A mist used to rise from the land and water the entire surface of the ground. Verse 7, then the Lord God formed. That is, you know, it's literally the Hebrew here, he's formed. You can see it with his hands. He formed, okay, man. He formed man. He created the body of man from the dust of the ground. You get the idea, you get the picture of an artist who's working, you know, almost, you know, with clay and he's forming, oh, I want a little of this. This is the sense of what you get in the Hebrew. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. Now, this is an interesting thing. It, you know, it, it, it's part of the Torah that was written by Moses, written somewhere in the 1400s B.C. Now, you know, I understand there are lots of revisionist scholars who won't agree with that date and say it's much later. But even the, if, you, if you were going to say, ah, oh, well, it was only written when they were in Babylon or something like this or during the time of the kings, you know, whatever it might be, it's still way, way, way B.C., way, way, way a long time ago, thousands of years ago, before we had what we now know as modern science. And when it, the count here it preserves, it says, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. You know, the interesting thing is the essential chemical elements found in soil are also found in humans and animals. This scientific fact wasn't discovered until recent times, but God was displaying it thousands of years before our modern science finally came along. Isn't that amazing? Ah, oh, but the Bible, you know, the Bible is one of these interesting books. It has a lot to say, and God said a lot and just a little at a time when people didn't understand what it meant. Anyways, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. That is, you know, a complete individual in body and spirit. He became what we understand as now as a human being. And the Lord God planted a garden, in some versions we'll say an oasis, in the east. This is a reference not to when he planted this garden. It's not to the, you know, reference to the creation of plant life that's earlier here in Genesis. But it's talking about God was planting specific plants. He, just like a gardener, takes, okay, I want, uh, you know, I, I want these trees over here, these bushes here, this type of grass over here. And I like the way it puts it together, the flowers I put it in, you know. This is how it's putting, he planted a garden in the east. In Eden, the interesting word is Eden here means a delight. It means a land of happiness. That's what it portrayed. The Lord God, you know, he planted this garden, specifically planted this garden in Eden, in Eden or, the, the, you know, the place of delight, the land of happiness. It's an amazing thing. What is God's nature? You put, just keep your finger here. We're going, to come, we're going to come back here to Genesis just a second. But let's turn to John in the Gospels. Let's go to the, uh, to the uh, Apostle John. John's Gospel in chapter 10 and verse 10, same with Amplified. 
And Jesus said, okay, later, you know, at this point in time, he says, a thief, notice this, a thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. That's why thieves come, to steal and kill and destroy. He said, but I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance, to have this life to the full till it overflows. That was God's purpose. And that was when he, planned, when he formed man and planted a garden and put them there in Eden. That was his purpose, that they would have life and that they have it to the full and in abundance in this land of happiness, in this land of delight. And he put the man whom he had formed there in verse 9 and in that garden the lord god caused to grow from the ground every tree that is desirable and pleasing to the sight and good that is you know good being suitable it's pleasant for food and then he mentions this the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden not necessarily for food you know that wasn't but if the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree and the way the the amplified puts it the tree of the experiential knowledge of the difference between good and evil or the the the, the tree of the recognition of good and evil Interesting. Let's go to Genesis here, stay in 2, and let's just skip down here to verse 15. G Genesis 2, 15, I'll go here to the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. Okay, this, you know, from this aspect, you know, maybe you might call it work fair, whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever you want to call it. He gave him a job to do. He did, it's not like he didn't have anything to do. He had this beautiful garden, but he had to work it. And he had to watch over it. And anybody who has a garden, and I, and I have one, boy, yeah, it, this time of year, you're working it, and you're watching over it, and you're doing the things you need to do to keep everything productive and moving forward. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man. Okay, commanded. Okay, didn't suggest. He commanded the man, you are free to eat from any of the trees of the garden. That is, you know, you're free to eat it unconditionally. He's given, and given access to it. All these trees, including, if you notice, the tree of life, you're free to eat from any tree of the garden, but, verse 17, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You, you mustn't eat it. You don't eat it. For on the day you eat it, you will certainly die. Literally, okay, that phrase in Hebrew is, and dying you shall die. You know, Adam and Eve were created mortal, physical beings. They would have eventually, didn't, you know, and they did, as old as they got, as you, find, as you can read later on in the scriptures and see, lived a long, long time, hundreds, you know, 900 some odd years, whatever it was, a long time before, but they, you know, in dying you shall die because they're just physical beings. As opposed, there is, there is that other religious group uh, who is the mainstream of Christianity who has what they call this preternatural uh, concept of Adam in their church and they think that well he would have existed as a as long as he hadn't uh, taken from the from the wrong tree he, he he would have existed forever that's what they think okay i mean they went through this a whole theology for thousands of years and i don't know how many books and pages are filled with that stuff but that's what they said but god said and when he said but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for in the day you eat from it you will certainly die, or in dying, you shall die. Okay, because I, I mean, in other words, you know, that's, that's the end type of thing, what he's saying. What was he saying? How do we know that, uh, you know, this concept of this other great church that is the largest in, in, in Christianity, the largest group, that they're, they're wrong in their doctrine here, that Adam, you know, 
before before he had sinned would have lived forever. Anyways, let's go to John chapter 3, John chapter 3 and verse 5. God had something in mind. There's a reason why he put the tree of life in the garden along with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But anyways, John chapter 3 and verse 5, and I'm with the Holman Christian Standard Bible here. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, water being baptism, the Spirit, of course, he, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless you're born of repentance, okay, and then of receiving the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then he explains this clearly, verse 6, whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Okay, that should be simple. I mean, it's a straightforward concept. And whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Spirit's not flesh. They're different. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. So let's go back to Genesis 3. Okay, let's flip back here, back to Genesis 3. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty. Always we used to have fun with the word subtle or subtile. You know, is the serpent was more crafty, crafty, skilled in deceit than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. You know, you, one of the things you'll see in a lot of translations, some will say, was the mo was the was the most most crafty of all the animals God made. You know, the, the animals of the field. But that's not what it really says. There's a slight difference here. The serpent was more crafty than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. Notice that. There's, a, there's something a little different here. But anyways. And the serpent, which of course, as you can later on see, or if you want to, to make a note, check out. Who was the serpent? Revelation 12, 9. Uh, verse uh, in verse Revelation twelve fourteen and verse fifteen and Revelation twenty two, we see the serpent is identified with Satan. The Bible that's what the Bible does at the end. And the serpent said to the woman, "Can it really be that God has said you shall not eat from any tree in the garden?" And the woman said to the serpent, "Okay, you know, and this is the old question, you know." Something comes up, looks like a serpent, and starts talking to you. You know, you know, Eve didn't know better than to not answer. You know, some people, if some weird people come up to you and start talking to you, don't answer. <laughs> you know, turn and go the other way. If you're, you know, if you're at the transit station downtown, you know, and some person comes up and talks, is talking weird to you, it may not be what you want. <laughs> you know, don't, don't get involved. Don't bite. Anyways, can it really be that God has said, you shall not eat from the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, except the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God said, you shall not eat, for, uh, eat from it, nor touch it, otherwise you uh, will die. But the serpent said to the woman, in dying, you shall not surely die. Okay, you know, just total contradiction, a lie. For God knows, but this is, his, for, this is his rationale. For God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. That is, you're going to have a greater awareness, and you will be as gods. Many translations will say, like God, okay, because, he, he, you know, the Hebrew word is here, Elohim, you like God or as gods. What was the temptation that was being? They were going to be as gods. They were going to be, you know, this was this is what he was suggesting, knowing good and evil. You will be as gods, knowing good and evil. Or you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil, those the way the Amplified puts it. But Coulter says, you will be like God and deciding good and evil. Knowing here, the Hebrew word for, for knowing, uh, yada, is to, to ascertain by observing, by experimentation, 
to distinguish, to discriminate, to know by experience, to be acquainted with. You will know good and evil. You know, you're going to decide for yourself who, what those things are. You're going to put your own values on what you think is good, and you're going to say on your own values what you think is evil. And this is the origin of relativistic morality right here. Because it changes from times and places and people. It really does, and it has over the course of the story of humanity. We have in our own strange things of what we're doing right now, taking the, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we're making our own decisions in our society right now, what is good and what is evil. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. And he, that is uh, God, said to Adam, because you listened to your wife's voice and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you and you will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you turn, return to the ground since you were taken from it. For you are dust and you will return to dust. This is perhaps one of the hardest things for people to understand. All we are as physical beings, we're dust. We have this, this, the, the breath of life from God and he gives us a consciousness that we have this human mind. We're not going into that today. But it, that makes us different from the animals. But the, you know, all it does is it allows us, it allows our, our physical brains to have mind power and to think and to reason, to be like, to have that image and likeness of God. God did that, but we're still, you know, all we are is dust. All we are is dust. And in dying, we shall surely, you know, we are going to die. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the end of the road for all of us because we're just physical. Now, you are dust and you will return to dust. Classically, this whole, this whole part here in Genesis 3 is called by theologians like the Augustine of Hippo as the, the fall. Okay, the fall. After which, you know, after the fall, you know, according to this theology, human nature became utterly depraved utterly depraved. That's the way Augustine of Hippo, and he was a superstar of the, uh, uh, of the Roman Universalist Church, the Roman Catholic Church. He said that human nature would be utterly depraved and human free will would become utterly corrupted so it could only choose evil thereafter. <laughs> well, is this so? You know, God said, of course, that you have the, you know, you'll be deciding good and evil. Augustine said, yeah, they'll be deciding it all right, and they're only going to decide for evil. Anyways, let's go to Genesis, staying with Genesis 3. Let's go to verse 22. So after he had, after he had told Adam that, you know, you, you, you're dust, and you're just going to go back to dust. I mean, that's the road you're on. The Lord God said, since man has become like one of us. This is interesting. The Lord God said, since man has become like one of us, Okay, who is, who, who is the us? It's not, you know, like me. <laughs> he's, he's saying us. It's like he's speaking to a group of people, a group of beings. It's plural, very clearly. Since man has become like one of us. Remember, mankind was created in the image and likeness of God. Elohim. Like us. Uh, so, knowing, that is, deciding good and evil, since man has become like one of us, deciding, making his own decisions, taking to himself the right to choose what is good and may and decide what is evil, he must not reach out and take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. That was the consequences. God said, oh no, we're not going down this road. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to have all these people who are going to decide on, you know, if, you know, in the universe, who are going to be deciding for themselves what's right and wrong and just making a chaos out of the place. I want a land of happiness. I want a land of abundance and peace. That's why I made Eden. That's what this whole experiment was about. 
That's what I started it as. So we must not reach out and take from the tree of life, eat and, and live forever. So the Lord God sent him away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. And he drove man out and stationed the cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming, whirling sword, or a sword that turned every which way to guard the way to the tree of life. You know, the fact that this is, of course, entered into the memory of all the ancient Middle Eastern peoples is well known. I mean, one of their biggest symbols that they had in the ancient Near East was the tree of life symbol of the hope of a tree. See, they, they knew the story. They had, they still, even all those things, and then you see it in their art, the tree of life. It's, it was one of those prominent motives that was there. The Scythians had it. They had necklaces and all these other things. We still use this whole idea of the tree of life. It's part of our cultural iconography. It really is, and it was throughout the ancient world among, uh, the, you know, this is, it's, it's a major thing, and you see it preserved in the culture. And even the idea of these caribou with their flaming swords, you know, and you, you know, the ancient peoples like the Assyrians and others had, had you know, did their sculptures of caribums. You know, even on the Iraqi flag for a while, they still had the thing with the, with the caribum with the swords. You know, that was where it was from. It was an amazing, you know, of course we all say it's just mythology and all made up from this standpoint. But, but, you know, it's, I don't, you know, you look at the, the Bible is the book of beginnings, you know, and much of what the Bible, you know, has preserved for us is a clear account in many other places. It became a garbled account, okay, as they moved far, as people moved farther and farther away from God, they didn't have his revelation. We have God's revelation, okay. The tree of life, of course, is God's revelation. There's no secret about that necessarily. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, deciding for yourself what is good and what is evil. You know, do your own thing in major way is very, very different. Let's go to Hosea. Yes, God put, you know, cherubim with flaming, whirling sword, which is an amazing thing to guard the way to the tree of life. Hosea 6 and verse 4. Hosea 6 and verse 4. You know, what Adam did, because he was under no, no compulsion, he, had, he wasn't being forced, he, he just chose made a bad choice he you know he, he didn't you know <laughs> anyways in Hosea 6 and verse 4 and I'm going to cite the Holman Christian Standard Bible here and God is saying okay he's talking to his people he's saying what am I going to do with you Ephraim okay one of God's you know part of the children of Israel his chosen people what am I going to do with you Judah okay here are the two the two arms of it were, were the representative leading tribes of the you know of all the children of Israel <clears throat> what am I going to do with you he says your loyalty is like the morning mist and like the early dew that vanishes yeah I go out in the morning and the dew was there you know, and it's, and it's all these things, but once the sun comes up, it's gone. He says, he, he, your loyalty is just like this mist. It vanishes. This is why I have used the prophets to cut them down. You know, the prophets in the scriptures. And I have killed them with the words of my mouth. My judgment strikes like lightning. Verse 6, for I desire loyalty. Loyalty, loving loyalty, loving kindness, loyalty, and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. He wants knowledge of God, not sacraments, not liturgy, okay, not lighting of candles and all this other stuff. He wants the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Verse 7, but they like Adam. Okay, his people who should have known better, who were given his revelation, but they, like Adam, have violated the covenant. They have betrayed me, or that is, they have dealt faithlessly with me. They betrayed me. They've dealt faithlessly with me. I had a covenant with them. I had a relationship, and they betrayed me. The world today vociferously insists not only upon rights, Human my, I want my human rights. 
but they insist upon their right to eat from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. They definitely want to, you know, decide for themselves what is good and, and evil. And, you know, it's even gotten to the point now in our society, they want to keep others from eating from the tree of life. <laughs> they, they, they really do. You know, just as picking out of the news here just this week, at the Desert Rose Elementary School in Palmdale, California, you know, a seven-year-old student came to school with an encouraging note and a few simple Bible verses tucked into his, his you know, his lunch bag by his mom, a woman named Christina Zavala. It says the seven-year-old boy read the note and verse and showed them to his friends during lunchtime at school. Soon, multiple students at, and this student is named just C, okay, because now it's a court case, at C's school were asking for copies of the notes, which included short stories from the Bible. When one girl said to, to a teacher, this is the most beautiful story I've ever seen, she had a copy. Well, the response from the teacher was separation of church and state, and it went right up to the principal, and the notes were banned from lunchtime distribution. Seven-year-old boy C was told that the school gate was the only location in which he could give the Bible verses to his friends and only after the bell rang. Then C was further reprimanded by his teacher in front of the whole class twice <laughs> and told to stop talking about religion or sharing his mother's notes. And of course, you know, a first grader was he's going to go home in tears. I mean, really, the world had collapsed. But that wasn't the end of it. The school then called up the local sheriff's office and had them send out a deputy to seize home, the seven-year-old kids, to go out and chew out the mother and tell them to stop sharing the Bible verses with his classmates. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Really? Because people might be offended. <laughs> they, they were warned of violating someone's civil rights. Well, who's, <laughs> whose rights are they violating? You look at where we've come to. I mean, this is totally different. Look, when I was a kid in public school, I remember going to school and they would read to us from the Bible. Bible was the, it was, was the source. Even if you weren't much of a believer, it was the source of all of our culture. It's how you understood where we are and, and all these different things. You can't even read Shakespeare without reading the Bible and understand it. Did you know that? The Bible is the foundation of the English language. Some of you would be offended because the first year old at, at his lunch break would sit down and talk to his friends and share something. You know, how silly. One person said he expects something like that from when he, where he grew up in communist Romania, you know. Talk about the land of the free. <laughs> Land of the free? Home of the brave? Send out the deputies to chew out the mom for sending a note with her, with her first grade son. My goodness. Now, story two here. Maya Dillard Smith, interim director of the Georgia chapter of the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, not a conservative organization, okay? For those of you who don't know it, resigned after her own young daughters were traumatized by having to share a bathroom with a couple of six foot tall men with deep voices who claimed they were transgendered. My children were visibly frightened, concerned about their safety, and left asking questions for which I, uh, Mrs. Smith said, like many parents, was ill prepared to answer. These are elementary school kids. She had explaining her residence, she resigned from the ACLU you know, and she, she said, why is ACLU supporting legislation f favored by the transgender lobby? The African-American mother accused the ACLU of having become a special interest organization that promotes not all, but certain progressive rights. Yeah, what happened to the right? Privacy, what happened, you know, what happened to her rights, her daughter's rights? She also said that the rights the group chooses to support is based on the funding that who's given the money to, to the organization to do their lobbying? <laughs> you know, a, a, a journalist once uh, named, uh, I guess he's dead now, he's a late journalist living, uh, Irving Crystal, once defined a conservative as a liberal who's been mugged by reality. 
<laughs> yeah, a liberal who's been mugged by reality becomes a conservative when they really say all of a sudden they find out that other people are, they want to impose their views and everything else on them. Conservative columnist Alan Keyes notes, we all know that our sincere friends are the ones willing to risk that friendship by frankly telling us truths that provoke our pride, insecurity, or shame. And if you haven't had to do that, you're not a good friend. You know, if you've had friends and you see something, you, you have a duty to speak up for your friend. But you do risk your friendship, I know. I've had to do that and I've lost, I've lost friends. But I felt I couldn't be silent. I had to say something. That's what a real friend is, and that's what a real friend does. America's founding constitutional uh, fathers, men who highly valued the teachings of the Bible, he says, were realists about human weaknesses, vulnerabilities, and deceitful temptations that could lead people to put themselves in the hands of their worst enemies. This is why they wrote the U.S. Constitution the way they did with the separation of powers and various limits on government authority. Unlike what we see today in the elitists who are running our contemporary society, the founders of the constitutional government of the USA did not have contempt for ordinary people. You know, he's saying that the people who are running our society right now have contempt for ordinary people. And, you know, what are and who are ordinary people? This is the root word. The meaning of this is the disposition of the ordinary of people is to respect the norms and rules that make human social life sustainable. Our society is becoming unsustainable. This book is the source of the rules and norms that make a human society sustainable, peaceful, harmonious, just. And as our leaders, these, this elite who, who has uh, total disrespect and despises ordinary people, especially any conservative, social conservative people, they're creating an unsustainable society. And we've done this in a, such a very, it's a major social experiment we're undergoing and we think there's going to be no consequences. Here in Canada, those were American examples, but here in Canada I heard this week on the radio, you know, Trinity Western College is a private conservative Christian school. They want to have an accredited uh, law school and they've been struggling with those who hate them because they have a, a community covenant that they have, to, it's, it's voluntary. Okay, the, the institution is private, it accepts no money from the government, and they want to have, in their community, they have everybody sign a, a list, a uh, community covenant that states that there will be no sexual behavior outside of marriage between a man and a woman, like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And this has, is, is, is a cause celebre in Canada these days. There are law societies that are going, you can't do that, you can't. I mean, what is freedom of association? What is freedom of religion? What is free, to, free speech? You can't have that. You have to buy into what we've decided is good and what we decided is evil. It's all relativistic thinking. They are eating from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they don't even understand where they're coming from. And what's it going to mean? What's it going to mean? They don't want that institution to have the freedom to say, well, this is, you know, voluntary association. You don't have to go to that school. It's not paid for by public money but they don't want to allow them the right to do that. And if they, these people do, if they do get their law school and they graduate, they don't want to have them accredited in the law society so they can actually be lawyers and have some sort of role in our society. <laughs> because lawyers, of course, have a lot of role to do with, you know, a lot to do with government. And they certainly don't want that. No. So how long is this going to go on, this eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this insistence on thinking that we are our own gods? Boy, have we bit with the 
serpent offered and said to eat, you know, and dying you will die. You know, God knows that you're going to be just, you're going to be like God. You're going to be as God. You're going to be able to do this yourself. Make your own decisions for what's right and wrong. And God just doesn't want you to eat of this tree because he wants to keep you down. How long is this going to go on? Well, it'll go on till the day it doesn't. Isaiah chapter 5, if you turn with me in the prophets, prophet Isaiah chapter 5, I'm going to cite this one in the New Living Translation. I like the more modern rendering. Sometimes you get lost in a little bit of the older language. The modern concept here, the way they've done a good job out of this one. This is Isaiah chapter 5, verse 15. The common man will be humbled. The man of importance degraded. Even the arrogant will lower their eyes in humiliation. But the Lord of heaven's armies will be exalted by his justice. The Lord of hosts. The holiness of God will be displayed by his righteousness. In that day, lambs will find good pastures. And fattened sheep and nomads will eat among the ruins of the rich. What sorrow for those who drag their sins behind them with ropes made of lies, who drag wickedness behind them like a cart. They even mock God and say, hurry up and do something. We want to see what you can do. Let the Holy One of Israel carry out his plan. for We want to know what it is. Yeah. God does have a plan, <laughs> and he is going to carry it out. You wait for it. He does have a plan. He has a millennial plan that's coming up. This society is not sustainable, and we're going to find out what that's going to be. I don't know, maybe even my lifetime, if I live long enough. Verse 20, what sorrow for those who say that evil is good, and good is evil. So Isaiah chapter 4. 5 and verse 20. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. What that dark is light and light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. They're so progressive progressively clever. What sorrow for those who are heroes at drinking wine and boast about all the alcohol they can hold. They take bribes to let the wicked go free and they punish the innocent. Haul them up in human rights tribunals. Therefore, just as fire licks up stubble and dry grass shrivels in the flame, so their roots will rot and their flowers wither. Isaiah is, is really scorching them here. They have rejected the law, that is the Torah, the teaching, okay, the revelation. That comes from this book. They've rejected the teaching of the Lord of hosts armies, and they have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. This is a prophecy that's coming true in our time. It is true. I mean, it's, 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 it's right now. This is the time we're living in. We're, this exciting time, times of biblical prophecy. Well, you know, hey, you know, dangerous times. Scary times. So how long will this go on? Go on, this eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Turn with me in the New Covenant Scriptures to the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews, chapter 11 and verse 6. Book of Hebrews, chapter 11 and verse 6. Staying with the home and uh, Christian Standard Bible here for a moment. Now, faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Notice that. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. The one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. That's what's going to make people who are going to look to the other tree that was in the Garden of Eden rather than the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's, it's what's going to be different because it, it, we must approach this whole question of how long this is going to go on with faith. 
We have to believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Let's go to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. This is a, a miktam of David. David had a very, very different idea than what Adam had or what, you know, all, so many of these people now, you know, whether it's the school uh, principal there down at this, this elementary school in Palmdale or the various uh, critics of Trinity Western and University and the, their community covenant. Very different. We need to take th thought on this. Psalm 16, verse 1, Keep and protect me, O Lord, for in you I have placed my trust and found refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my God. I have no good besides you. That's right. God is the one who defines. We know where or the good is. It's with God. And what he says is evil is evil, and what's wrong is wrong. Verse 3, as for the saints, that's godly people, they're not talking about somebody nominated by the Catholic Church, but ordinary godly people who are in the land. They are the majestic and the noble and the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows, that is the pain and suffering of those who have chosen another God, will be multiplied. See, those who choose another God or make gods of themselves, is what, which is what we're doing now, Worship, you know, just like the, the Greeks would worship as ancestor worship. Zeus and all this was old. They were actually a sort of a form of ancestor worship. But now we're worshiping ourselves. It's idolatry. The sorrows of those who have chosen another God, a God other than the creator God, they're going to have sorrows and pain and suffering. I will not pour out, David says, their drink offerings of blood. Of course, blood was an unclean thing, okay, which, you know, connected with idolatry, you know. And, and, Nor will I take their names upon my lips. The Lord is a portion of my inheritance, my cup. He's all I need. You support my lot. The boundary lines of the land have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. You know, this, this, what David is saying here is actually a, a prophecy. It's a prophecy of the coming kingdom of God, of the millennial kingdom where the saints, the, those who are godly, will have a heritage. And it's going to be a, a great heritage. This is what he's promising them. Verse 7, I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Say, where does he get his counsel? David, you know, you know the... Beloved of God, he got his counsel from God. He didn't look inside to himself and say, well, I'll figure out myself what's right and wrong. David didn't do that. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my heart instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. David had a lot who opposed him, by the way. When you read through the story of David, verse 9, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My body too will dwell in safety. That's confidently, he has this confidence. Verse 10, For you will not abandon me to Sheol. You're not going to abandon me to the grave, to the place of the dead. Nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. We know this was a messianic prophecy. But it's also true of the saints and God's holy ones. Verse 11, you will show me the path of life. You know, what that's going to lead to the tree of life. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures evermore. It was the Bible's God that created Eden. It created it as the land of happiness, the land of joy, the land of abundance, the land of peace. But, he, but our human ancestors instead, they wanted to be gods, their own gods. And so they wanted to take to themselves what they thought was going to, you know, make up their own minds of what was right and wrong. And, and you know, the story is, they always chose what was wrong. And we had, you know, so often, so much of the time, too much of the time, too much of the time. Look at our world right now. 
It's this mixture, good and evil. Let's go to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 and verse 6. Hebrews 2 and verse 6. One has testified somewhere in Scripture saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you so graciously care for him? That you planted a garden for him. You formed him with your own hands. You have made him a little lower in status than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You set him over the works of your hands. See, all these things talking about what he did at Eden. What God, the creator God, did in Eden. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now in putting all things in subjection to man, he left nothing outside his control. But at present we do not yet see all things subjected to him. Oh yeah, there's a lot that's subjected to man, but not everything. But we do see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while. By, pay, by taking on the limitations of humanity, the Amplified adds there, crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might experience death for the sins of everyone. For it was fitting that God, fitting for God because it's an act worthy of his divine nature, is fitting for God that he for whose sake are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the author and founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus had to, you know, he, he God the Father decided, to, you know, in, in, in making the, salva the, the Savior of humanity, bringing him to maturity, he had to have a human experience necessary to be perfectly equipped for his, to exercise his office of high priest. And now in this present world, we too are having our experiences. Living in a society that's eating from the wrong tree. So we'll be fully prepared for our roles in the coming kingdom of God to serve as kingly priests. Because we'll know the end results of a society that eats from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. We'll know it. We won't have to guess. We'll have lived it. Verse 11, Hebrews 2, verse 11. Both Jesus who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, sanctified being spiritually transformed and being made holy and set apart for God's use, and those who are sanctified are all of one Father. And for this reason, he's not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. And that's our ultimate where we're going is to be Jesus' brothers and sisters. Let's go here to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, and verse 21, same with the Home Christian Standard Bible. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ will all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. You know, we're coming up to the feast festival of first fruits. After, afterwards, that is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the very end, the end, when he hands over the kingdom to the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power. Anything established contrary to God. Anything that came from the fruit of humanity eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's all going to, you know, it's all going to be, you know, abolished. He's going to hand it over, the kingdom to God. You know, this is an interesting thing because it's talking about how, talk about progressive, how the kingdom of God progressively spreads and progressively grows to affect humanity. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. Remember right from the beginning there in the Garden of Eden as he said to Adam and he said to Eve, in dying you shall surely die if you take it the wrong tree. Let's go down here and see in 1 Corinthians 15 to verse 45. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth and made of dust. The second man is from heaven. Like the man made of dust, 
so are those who are made of dust. Just like what we are right now. Like the heavenly man, so are those who are heavenly. And just as we have borne the image of the man made of dust, we will also bear the image of the heavenly man, Jesus Christ. Verse 50, brothers, I tell you this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God and corruption cannot inherit incorruption. Truly there remains for those of us of the household of faith to eat of that other tree which our ancestors in Eden rejected because they wanted to decide for themselves and take to themselves the right of what was good and evil. And they've created all the society which is unsustainable. But we have a hope and we have a future. Stay with us next week. And next week we'll come up and we'll be talking more as we come into the, first, the festival of the first fruits and we'll talk more on the tree of life. Till then.